Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 23rd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what the new OMB director will tell us about the future direction of the Dunleavy administration and who we would appoint to the job if it were our pick. Second, why the Alaska GOP's decision to cancel the Republican presidential preference poll is a big deal. And third, what Representative Laddie Shaw's rejection by the Senate Republicans tells us about where we are headed on the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Let's crack into what's going on here in the state government. We talked a little bit last week about the departure of Donna Arduin, but we did not discuss the next step. And the next step is, of course, uh, where the next OMB director will take us and what it tells us about the governor's direction going forward. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, uh, uh, Donna's, Donna's appointment originally by the governor sent a message that we're going to get serious about cutting. We're going to get serious about uh, identifying places uh, where we can roll back government, and roll back costs, uh, and get the cost of government under control. Uh, the next OMB director is going to send is going to send a message also, uh, and it's going to send a message that you know that reflects that the the new OMB uh, director's past and uh, and what that OMB director what that new OMB director would bring to the to the table. The the names that have circulated so far, and there haven't been many. But the names that have circulated so far, in my mind, raise raise concerns. Uh, the most prominent name that's been mentioned, uh, and it's shown up in several places, including most recently uh, in an article by uh, 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 <laughs> come here, Brad. Oh, an article by Tim Bradner uh, in the uh, in the Frontiersman right. is former Senator An- Anna McKinnon, um, and and that. That would that would that raises concerns in my mind for two reasons. One, uh, Anna was uh, was an advocate of changing the PFD. Uh, she had bills in while she was in the Senate uh, to cut the PFD, uh, frankly, uh, in half uh, to cut it from 50 percent of the earnings stream down to 25 percent of the earnings stream, um, and and was a strong advocate of of cutting the PFD. Anna also was um, an advocate of of cutting uh, spending, but certainly not uh, anywhere near to the same levels that uh, uh, Donna Arduin was, and uh, frankly, not to any uh, in in terms in terms of Anna's case, not to any significant uh, extent. Uh, in terms of it was she was more focused on stabilizing the cost of government as opposed to reducing the cost of government. So her appointment would send a message that uh, maybe we're not going to be serious about cutting government. We're going to we're going to try to stabilize the cost of government and given her background and and certainly would send a message on the PFD that the that the that the PFD not only is is in need of reform but but in need of frankly deep cuts given her bill to to cut it in half uh the other name that circulated that i've seen uh, is a former a former OMB director Cheryl Frasca Cheryl was OMB director under uh, governor Murkowski Frank Murkowski um and and is someone who also brings uh uh a past would would also bring a past to the table, not as much in terms of her work uh, for Governor Murkowski, because a lot of that, uh, frankly, has been overtaken by events uh, with subsequent governors. But but in her position as chair of 
uh, of Commonwealth North and, and one of Commonwealth North's uh, subcommittees, the, the Fiscal Action Policy Group. And in, in that capacity, uh, Cheryl has been an advocate, again, of cutting the PFD um, in, in, in substantial ways um, and, and has been in, in discussions, uh, has been uh, much more moderate on cutting spending. Uh, I guess the, the way to put that would be recognizing the need for government spending as opposed to cutting spending, but has been much more moderate on cutting, cutting spending uh, than, uh, than certainly Donna was or certainly the governor has talked about being in the past, has talked about being in the past. So those are the two names that I've seen that I've seen circulated. So it, the, the, the appointment of, 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 of Donna's replacement uh, it's going to be a significant event. It, it, it and, and it becomes more significant the longer the longer they delay it. Uh, when when Ben Stevens first announced it a week ago, Monday I believe a week mm -hmm. ago yesterday. Right. Um, my recollection is he said that they would have a replacement within a week. Uh, we're now we're now uh, beyond that week. We're beyond Friday. Um, uh, it was not only my recollection, but others' recollections that they that he said they would appoint by Friday, uh, and we're now beyond that. And so, you you can sort of imagine that the administration is dealing with another uh, personnel issue right now. The 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 substitute or the replacement for uh, Laddie Shaw's nomination in in the Senate District M seat, and and that's probably taking up a lot of oxygen in the room. But OMB director is is a big deal. We are in. A particularly important phase of the budget cycle for the OMB director. This is when the administration is bringing uh, its budget together, uh, and the OMB director plays a key uh, key role in that. You can imagine that's uh, that's probably part of the reason why uh, for uh, the conversion of Donna from uh, from the OMB director to a consultant that there was some there was some uh, 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 pushback. On what she was doing as OMB director, it's 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 an important part of the cycle. It's an important role, uh, and I think that uh, whoever the governor appoints is gonna is gonna send a message. I would be hopeful, frankly, that the governor put in that role somebody uh, who was has long been an advocate of 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 spending cuts, uh, would continue to look for uh, opportunities to uh, to bring spending down. Someone who's been an advocate of the PFD. Um, uh, and has 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 defended the PFD and has continued to push the PFD. Those are the two. Those are the two criteria I think that I'm going to be looking for when they finally appoint a new uh, OMB director. And the names that have surfaced so far really disappoint on both those issues. Well, and I think you mentioned the timing. The timing is what really bothers me about this. I mean, we are hot and heavy in the middle of budget discussions. The governor's budget is due in just over two months. Uh, so they are they should be in the middle of this and the departure the timing of the departure of Donna Arduin is very troubling to me simply because this is when they should be in the middle of all this deeply and uh, and as you said I think it signals kind of a a, a a you know a group that's at cross purposes now yesterday during our discussion with the governor I asked him point blank and specifically does this change? Your per, you know, your outlook, uh, because I would say that the the, the push of, of Ben Stevens uh, is more towards the traditional Republican uh, kind of spending uh, versus uh, Donna Arduin's kind of spending. And he said, no, no, he's still committed to cutting. Um, he's still committed to cutting the uh, uh, the budget. And uh, he said that that was that was fine, uh, that he's continuing in that direction. But I just don't know is that is true at this point based on the people that he's surrounding himself with well you know you've got you've got you got ben uh you've got uh bruce Tan tangerman who who was the staff director for the senate republicans when they came up with these bills to uh during the pete kelly anna mckinnon era to to cut the pfd uh, you got bruce at, at department of revenue that's been troubling to me all along uh but you had donna at omb who sort of acted as a counterbalance to that and so now the question is, what are you going to do about that role? I mean, one way out of this, I guess, for the administration is to put a technocrat, uh, uh, someone who is 
uh, familiar with with the, the the details of of how you put a budget together. Somebody who is who is good at the process of bringing the budget together, good at working with the with the cabinet officials, good at, at numbers and running spreadsheets, uh, and put somebody in that role who who really who really fills that function. But that would send a message also <laughs> that that they're that they're going to limit the role of the OMB director, or they're looking at a reduced role for the OMB director, just somebody to bring the spreadsheets together, um, and and that would send a message that that you're not going to have in that role, at least in the administration, a strong advocate uh, of cutting. I, I I think I think this a uh, this is a a, 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 a a sort of an inflection point for the administration. About about the message they're going to be sending forward. I understand the governor uh, governor's message that he's he's continuing to stay on track, but who you put in these key roles and what these people do when they're in these key roles uh, is critical to, to having a functioning government. The governor governor can't be all places at all times, uh, and who you put in these in these in these critical roles really is is controls how your how your administration is carried out. I've long advocated frankly somebody that i think would be a great person uh for uh, uh for the role of omb director Un unfortunately unfortunately she's tied up trying to figure out what happened in the bahamas to her property in the bahamas but i think former representative lynn gaddis would be a, a terrific omb director she is someone who's been a, a a long advocate of of cutting spending and finding areas to reduce spending she was one of the key votes uh back in in 2016, when when those who wanted to modify the OMB, Anna and Pete and others who wanted to modify the PFD, got a bill through the Senate. Uh, it was in the House. She and Tammy uh, uh, Wilson were the key votes. Were key votes in stopping that bill in House Finance. It got stopped by one vote. Key votes in stopping that bill uh, going forward. I know Lynn uh, has that there are people who. Uh, we're concerned about our vote for SB 91, the, the 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 criminal justice reform bill, and I know that's added to that added to problems that she had in 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 her in her campaign for election to the Senate. But OMB really wouldn't deal with that issue. OMB deals with spending, and and deals with getting the budget uh, under control. Right. And I th and I think she would be a, she somebody like her, either Lynn or somebody like her. Would be the would send the right message and be the right person uh, for that position. I think Senator Anna McKinnon and former Senator Anna McKinnon and Cheryl Frasca just send the completely wrong message uh, out there about uh, about what direction the administration's taking. Let me hit a couple of the uh, comments here in the chat room, Brad, so you can uh, reply to those. Um, um, Don says Lynn Gaddis would be terrible. She held the line to get reelected. She failed at that. He says. Um, and Harold asked, what is Lynn's background in that regard? Um, somebody else made a comment that she broke her faith with people in the Valley because she went to work for Tammy after Tammy went over to the House majority. Um, but I think that I think that Lynn's got a pretty good handle on where things uh, need to be. And that was one of the reasons why I think in the long run uh, she got voted out of the uh, she got voted out of the uh, the House and didn't get well, didn't get voted into the Senate, I guess I should say. Partially because she did the same thing that the governor did, which was take a crack at some of the senior benefits and some of the other things that really kind of uh, got her hand smacked in the cookie jar, so to speak. Well, Lynn, I, I mean, few people give her the credit she deserves for stopping stopping the PFD. I mean, I, we need to go back to 2016. The Senate had passed a reform bill that cut the PFD in half, cut it from 50% of earnings down to 25% of earnings. That was in a bill that the Senate passed. It came over to the House uh, and it came to, to House Finance. Um, and and in it, if it had gotten out of House Finance, it would have gone to the floor. Uh, and I think the general expectation at the time was that would have it would have passed on the floor um, uh, in 2016. And so we wouldn't be having these PFD debates uh, anymore, we would have. There would have been a restructuring to the statute. The PFD would have been cut in half, um, and people would have said, "Oh, that's too bad. It shouldn't have happened." But it's but it happened, and so and so we're going to go on and and continue with that. That stopped. You and I both remember this. <laughs> remember this vote clearly. That stopped in House Finance uh, by a that was stopped by a one vote margin. 
uh, Republicans voting, uh, generally voting, in fa- and some Democrats voting in favor of the bill, but six votes against it if they hadn't if they hadn't been there and at that time uh, taking the stand they did using the, the using the uh, the knowledge that they had of how government ran. Um, uh, we, we wouldn't be having a PFD debate. It'd be all over, and the PFD would be cut in half. I was reading this piece in the Frontiersman about the major shakeup, the departure of Arduin following the departure of Tucker and Babcock, which, again, kind of along, fell along the same rails that I was saying, look, this is a major shakeup. This is the same path that they used to oust Tucker and Babcock. Uh, one, of the, one of the classic comments in this whole piece is right here. Uh, it says, Ben Stevens, the new chief of staff, is conservative, but more a traditional Republican. What do you think that means? Well, it, it's, it's, it's Natasha Von Himoff. It's Bert Stedman. It's, uh, it's Gary Stevens. It's, it's Republicans who, who, who talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Uh, it's Republicans who say we ought to have a smaller government, but when it comes down to voting for smaller government, don't. It's Republicans who say we ought to have a strong private economy, but when it talks, but when you talk about preserving the PFD, which is a, which is a piece of the private economy, they don't. They tax it and that over to government. Now, I'm not I, Ben. Ben, I, I am not as down on Ben as I am on say somebody like Anna McKinnon or Pete Kelly. Uh, frankly, because Ben was out of the legislature when this, when, when, when we've, we've gone through this latest round of people trying to cut the PFD and, and preserving government spending. To me, Ben is sort of, is sort of somebody who's still out there, um, uh, yet to prove, uh, his position one way or the other. We'll sort of see it in the upcoming legislature. Uh, but, but Donna Mc, or, or Anna McKinnon clearly. Uh, has has proven where she is uh, with her with her actions uh, as as co-chair of Senate Finance, um, and and Cheryl Frasca has clearly proven where she is uh, with uh, the the positions that the Commonwealth North has taken over the past uh, over the past few years. So it's um, Ben doesn't fall quite in that same category, but but certainly when people write about it that way, I think they're talking about the Natasha Monimovs and the Anna McKinnons and the Pete Kellys and the All right. uh, and the Gary Stevens and the others who want to want to keep government where it is. Right. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on the weekly top three. Let's move on to number two. We'll get into it here for a couple of minutes before we have to pull the plug up on the break. Uh, the Alaska GOP has uh, uh, pulled a, uh, a shutdown on the debate on what you say is a critical issue. Now, it's not unlikely that this has happened. This has happened in other states as well when you have an incumbent president, but we're talking specifically about the presidential preference poll. Yeah, we've been through, uh, well, the, the background, the Republicans uh, at their uh, meeting on Saturday uh, of the district chairs uh, decided to cancel uh, the Republican presidential primary in Alaska uh, for this coming election cycle, essentially endorsing uh, President Trump uh, and rejecting uh, the, uh, providing an opportunity for any challengers, for the challengers to President Trump, we already have challengers, for the challengers to have a forum up here uh, to talk about the issues. You and I have talked on, on, on a number of occasions now on the show, and we'll continue to talk about it as we get into the federal election cycle, about about the situation that the that the that we find ourselves in with national debt, and about the deficits that we're running uh, at the federal level. Uh, we talked, I think, last week or the week before about the fact that on its current trajectory, the Trump administration is now going to run up a higher uh, higher deficits, higher contribution to national debt. Uh, during its term than even the Obama administration is, which you know, most people point to as being the, the worst from that standpoint, um, and, and that, that the Trump administration has just sort of given up, frankly, uh, on trying to, to, to bring the deficit down. They've reduced revenues through the tax cuts. Uh, they've increased spending. Uh, a bill this year that, that the Trump administration negotiated uh, set new records in terms of spending uh, and, and has terminated uh, a hard-fought bill, uh, the the Budget Control Act from 2011, from the from the Tea Party era, terminated that bill going forward. There are no there are no constraints on spending going forward. It's just going to be a year-to-year negotiation. There are challengers. There is one challenger, one particular challenger, uh, on that issue, raising that issue uh, 
uh, in, um, uh, in, in the presidential primaries. Former representative, former governor of South Carolina, Mark Sanford, um, is, is running on that issue, is running on, on fiscal issues. And using the, the, the opportunity of the, of, the, of the primaries to get that message out, talk about that message, educate people uh, on that issue, and, and press voters on whether they think that's, a, that's, that's the right track for America to be on or whether we ought to be on a different track uh, with, represent, with <clears throat> former Governor Sanford outlining that different track. Right. No, it's good to have uh, some alternate voices. Talking about our weekly top three, we were talking about number two, which was the elimination of the presidential preference poll here in the state of Alaska, essentially eliminating the Republican primary for president in favor of Trump. My comment on this whole thing was, uh, because I've said this many times, I believe that every candidate should have a challenger, even in the primaries, because it helps keep that candidate sharp. It helps keep that candidate uh, on track and on target for what the principles that they may have run on uh, and what they should believe. Even candidates that I believe in, I think, should have a challenger simply because it keeps them on their toes. And I think the presidential uh, uh, primary is no different. And as you said, Mark Sanford has been running on fiscal issues, which is really the biggest thing in the room. And we talked about it last week when General James Mad Dog Mattis gets up and says one of the greatest threats to the United States is the amount of debt we're taking on. Uh, the, the greatest domestic threat, he says, is the debt we're taking on. Somebody ought to be paying attention to this. And instead, we're all embracing the kumbaya moment of, hey, we can spend it. It doesn't matter. There's no, you know, we can never go broke kind of thing. And somebody at least needs to bring the the uh, bring the topic up, even if it means that they have absolutely no chance of winning. Yeah, exactly right. And presidential primaries are the perfect opportunity uh, to do that. I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure I was on the same side of that, but we can remember 1968 when G. McCarthy, Senator G. McCarthy of Minnesota, challenged Lyndon Johnson in the in the New Hampshire primary. McCarthy didn't win uh, that primary, but he be, but he got a lot of votes, sent a message. Johnson ultimately uh, decided not to run for re-election, and 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 ultimately, the way things played out, there was a change in in Vietnam policy. It, it we need to have these discussions. There's a reason we have elections in this country, and the reason is just as you outlined, to 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 provide a forum for people to either re up on the decisions they've made in the past in the case of incumbents, or to or to to make changes, but at least to have a forum to talk about the issues in the context of, of who we're putting into office. There's also a reason that third world countries cancel elections. It's because they don't want to have those discussions. They don't want to challenge. They don't want to have a discussion about issues that have come up and issues that that, that affect their leaders. Their leaders just want to stay you know, perfectly comfortable in office, not have to face challenge, um, and, uh, and, and not have to face you know, having to explain the positions they've taken or, or talk about issues of the day. And, and unfortunately, the Alaska GOP, by canceling the Alaska uh, presidential primary, is falling more into a third world country uh, format than they are into a, into a, into a democratic uh, format. Mark Sanford, is, is, this is the perfect example. If, if Mark Sanford, if someone hadn't stepped up and, and, and wanted to talk about the fiscal issues, maybe then, maybe I'm, I'm more inclined to, to think that the, that the Alaska GOP's decision makes some sense. But we have a candidate who has stepped up, who's going to focus his entire campaign, he has said, on, on the fiscal issues, who is, who is walking that walk. And in the past, as governor of South Carolina, God, you think Dunleavy's had problem, has problems up here. Sanford had problems even in the South Carolina legislature when he was trying to cut, uh, cut costs down there. Uh, who's 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 walked the walk? Somebody who wants to step up and talk about those issues. Somebody who wants to bring to the attention of the voting public uh, the 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 trajectory that this administration is putting us on in terms of increasing the national debt, uh, and as as you quoted General Mattis as saying, uh, uh, increasing the the national security threat, one of the two biggest internal national security threats. Uh, gener according to General Mattis, that we have uh, uh, affecting affecting America today, so we need to have that discussion. We need to have that discussion. You and I had the discussion on the show. We're going to continue to have the discussion, but uh, Alaskans need to have that discussion and need to have the education of of what the current administration's fiscal policy is doing to us. We need to have the the full and robust uh, uh, exposition 
of those issues in the context of a, in the context of an election and the primary election uh, is the is the perfect way to do that. I, I'm just I, I'm I'm very disappointed in the Republican Party for 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 sort of shutting that that, that debate down. Now I will say this that Glenn Clary on a on an in an interview with Channel 11 uh, said that uh, said that they might be open uh, to uh, changing the district chairs might be open to changing that policy. Uh, depending upon how the election hap- how the how the primary uh, starts going, but the problem is it will be too late. Uh, uh, let's say, let's say that Sanford uh, do- gets a high number in New Hampshire, and he may, because uh, New Hampshireans tend to be concerned about fiscal issues. Uh, let's say he gets a high number in uh, in uh, in New Hampshire, but that comes uh, about 60 days before when Alaska was otherwise is otherwise supposed to hold its primary. So it's right. really too late. To, to change back then. Now is the time to say we're going to have a primary to create the opportunity for a discussion of these issues, to have the robust discussion of these issues uh, in Alaska. And and it's disappointing to see the, the, the GOP cut it down. Let's move on to number three. What the rejection of Laddie Shaw tells us about where the PFD is headed or not headed? Well, I, I think it tells us that the PFD is not going to be resolved as an issue, that, that there's really no no need to have a special session that it's not going to go any place uh, and that and that we're unlikely to resolve the the uh, uh, the PFD next year there is a very interesting article in today's uh, just published uh, uh, this morning uh, today's Anchorage Daily News an article by James Brooks that has extensive quotes from John Coghill in it right and Coghill must not have got the memo because Coghill's not talking about you know fulfilling the the Chris Birch uh, uh, philosophy and you know making sure we have somebody in there like Chris Birch, Coghill cut to the chase, um, uh, and and said that he didn't vote for Shaw's confirmation. I quote: I didn't support Shaw because of the long-term economy of Alaska and how the PFD plays into it. He said, N- none of this about oh we want to make sure that you know Chris Birch's legacy continues on. Coghill was blunt, uh, and and you got to give John on this issue at least that he's blunt about it. Coghill was blunt that it's a it, he took it as a vote on the PFD and just like you know just like any vote in the legislature on the PFD he's voting to side with uh, with PFD cuts and I think that means that we that we're not going to get the PFD resolved this year in a special session we're not going to re- get it resolved next year uh, in the regular session or any any special sessions that that flow out of flow out of next year we're we're now we're going to the 2020 election on the PFD issue and it's going to be fought. Uh, in the legislative seats um, uh, about uh, about about who we're going to send back to the to the legislature out of the 2020 election, it's going to be fought in the District M uh, 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 seat about who's going to you know who's going to come back for the seat that that Chris Birch uh, formerly occupied. I, I think I I think w- w- cutting to the chase on Laddie, it wasn't about Laddie at all. Uh, and and it's unfortunate that the that the senators uh, asked the questions they did that made it personal with Laddie, but it really wasn't about Laddie at all. This was baked. This was vote was baked in before they went into the meeting. It was the same vote that they came out of the meeting with, and as and as John says, as John in in a, in a moment of of transparency says, it was about the PFD, uh, pure and simple. And uh, and and I think that means it's going to stay six six in the Senate. Uh, it's going to stay divided uh, in the House, uh, and we're and and the governor is going to continue to hold to uh, to the position he has. And I think we just keep rolling this issue right into the 2020 election. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, he you can find it at uh, on Facebook, and you can find it on our Facebook page. We've got links up at the top of the page right now. Uh, I suggested yesterday to the governor that he should just resubmit Laddie Shaw's name if he can find some way to do it. He should just resubmit it over and over and over again and make him and you know make him choke down on it. Um, and he said that they were kind of looking at that, but I don't know what are what are your next thoughts here in the next minute here before we we gotta we gotta run. Well, the statute says you can't do that. So if we're still in the fall, I mean, maybe we we don't follow the law anywhere anymore. But the statute says that you'll submit another candidate, um, uh, and is fairly clear in saying that it can't be that it shouldn't be the same candidate that you had. So maybe, maybe they could nominate Brad Keithley, and then when Brad Keithley gets shot down, they could nominate Lad, Laddie Shaw again. I mean, I, you know, 
because that's another candidate. You know, that's another candidate. It could happen. I'm serious, Brad. That'd be a good one. Maybe we should nominate Brad Keithley. He's out. You're outside the list, so you're likely to be shot down anyway. Regard. I mean, even I mean, on top of the fact that you're a a pro uh, PFD statute follower, uh, but then if they did that, then they'd have to come back and uh, you know he could submit Laddie Shaw again, and he's on the list, and they'd have to they'd have to own that. There, there you go, Michael. There's one slight flaw in that. I don't live in District M. Well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> that's true. I'm sorry. I apologize. That's right. I forgot about that. You know, <laughs> you know some, some slight Come on. criteria there. Come on. What's it? it? Big deal. Nobody's following the law, like you said. Maybe we find, you know, just find somebody off the street and suggest that from District <laughs> M that they, you know, that they that they run in that. That would be great. Well, it's a. Uh, I, I I I think Laddie was the perfect candidate. Um, and 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 Laddie even I mean the, the really sad thing about this is Laddie said he was and you can talk to him about this in the next segment but Laddie said that he was open to to you know considering uh, changes in the PFD he thought we ought to have a full PFD this year but he was open to to changing it I mean come on what you're not you're not going to get any better uh, uh, candidate out of out of this governor I don't think uh, for the Senate than what the what the Senate had and if they were truly open to considering. Uh, alternatives, uh, they should have bit on that and said, great, uh, come on board. Uh, we're going to put you on the committee to work on changing uh, the PFD then because you said you're open to open to changes and sort of putting front and center out on that, that right. issue. Well, my understanding, but, my understanding is that there was questions asked about other things that were antithetical to the Dunleavy administration and getting including, uh, you know, PERS, TERS, defined benefits and some other things. And if that didn't show them that he was, uh, you know, at odds with the governor on some things, I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. It all comes down to. You know, will you pay a full PFD? That's what that's the bee that's stuck in their bonnet, and they are not going to let go. Well, and 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 I guess the point is, it's uh, will you pay a full PFD this year only? Because Laddie said he was open to to modifications uh, uh, going forward. I, it's just, I mean, it's sort of staggering. Uh, and and I commend John on Coghill on his openness about it. But it's just sort of staggering that that we have rejected who would somebody who would be a long term legislator from that who, who could be a long term legislator from that from that district on the basis of will you vote for you know cutting the PFD this year just just a this year issue and um, and I, 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 I it, it means nothing other than we're going to the 2020 election on this issue uh, yep. we're not going to get it resolved before then well this is a good issue to go to the election with uh, I mean I think that we could take a look at this and we start talking about uh, you know, we just start talking about uh, the 2020 election coming up. The number one issue, I think, is going to be amongst a lot of people, the PFD. I mean, it was one of the top three before with crime kind of edging it out because crime was so omnipresent. Now that that's been handled, we're going to talk about the budgets and the PFD. I think you're going to see I think you may see a little bit of a referendum going on with people who are like, this is ridiculous. Let's just, you know, get give us our PFD like you're supposed to and get government spending in line. I'm, I mean, that's what my hope is anyway. Well, and, and by then we will have had five, five years of cuts. We've had four years this year, uh, and we'll have another one next year because they're not going to be able to balance the budget uh, uh, without it. If they're not going to go to another tax, uh, they're going to use the PFD tax to balance it. So we'll have five years. It'll be the, you're right, it'll be the perfect time to cut. But we will have suffered through five years of this uh, before we finally get a legislative election clearly focused on it. I, uh, I was reading Natasha Von Imhoff. She posted on Facebook about something. Uh, about this and uh, I got to tell you it's pretty uh, it's pretty astonishing uh, what uh, you know again her comments uh, have to do with uh, again trying to find a clone of Senator Birch uh, and then she goes on to talk about the district data uh, and and one of the things she used that I think even undermines her um, undermines her argument is that only three votes separated Senator Birch and Representative Shaw in the same district. So for them to say that uh, he's not representing the will of their constituents seems to me to be counterintuitive to what you just said. Three votes separated them. And if they were so antithetical to each other, you wouldn't think that that would be a possibility. I mean, I think that that just undermines her whole argument uh, there right off the bat. Well, and then you look at the other half of the district. You had you had Josh Reback against Sharice Millett in the uh, in the in the primary there, Sharice had been one of those who was pretty squeamish about this PFD. She'd sort of go both ways. Josh was a staunch defender of the PFD, and Josh Josh won that primary over in the other district, and then won won the general election in that other district. So I, it, it's hard to say it's hard to say that 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 district is a pro PFD cut 
that Senate district's a pro PFD cut district when you got both representatives voting for the for the current PFD and both representatives having having you know won their elections by by taking that position. We got about a minute left here, Brad. What does this mean for the Republican Party? I mean, we're seeing all this stuff go on. We saw the the attempt to censure both the six senators in a minor censure and both Cop and uh, Johnston in a uh, in a in a major censor. Uh, censure, uh, and yet they they kind of fell apart. What what are your thoughts on that? I think I think to some degree the Republican Party has become irrelevant, right? And it's made made itself even more irrelevant with the decision on the presidential primary. Um, it's not the, the Republican Party doesn't have a cohesive position on these on these fiscal issues, uh, and it's sort of you know become a side a, a side player to to the to the battleground between pro PFD and anti PFD. Um, uh, uh, pro uh, government sp- uh, cu- government spending cuts, anti government spending cuts. I, the party's just not playing a role in that. The party's just moved itself off to the side. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, interesting conversations and interesting discussions. We appreciate you being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.